Beth, I think I'll start with you, David. Um, so, so you are the, the current head of institutional research. So I'm sure you handle with a lot of data and uh, also uh, help our client, your clients to use it in your, uh, you know, your day to day. So tell me a little bit um, how you manage to, you know, leverage this new regulations that are coming into force and how you help clients to better leverage data on the blockchain. Yeah, thanks, Nicole, and thanks for having me here. You know, so. I would argue that it's pretty challenging in the space. So I used to work in emerging markets research. And you know the question that we get more often in the crypto community that I didn't get when I was back in EM was, are there fundamentals in crypto? And that's not to argue that you know there are not anchors inside of crypto, but it's much harder because of the volume and variety of data that we have available here that a lot of people kind of say, listen, I, I know you've been around for 15 years, but you know, like what really can I actually anchor on? Like, in, you know, I used to do rates, for example, I used to do FX. Well, you know, you had interest rate differentials, you had inflation uh, on those asset classes. What do you do in crypto? And we often use frameworks that we've applied elsewhere. So people often take a fundamental equity view, try to apply it into crypto. And to some degrees, they work. But those analogs aren't perfect because this is, in fact, a very different asset class. For example, let's take two different things. One is Uniswap and one is Ethereum. Hopefully everyone in the crowd might be familiar with what these two different things are. One is the decentralized exchange, Uniswap, and one is the actual platform on which that exchange runs, Ethereum. Ethereum is basically akin to the World Wide Web. It's effectively saying, how, what would I pay for access to the internet today? Like, we don't have to do that because, as you know, the internet is free, but we pay for the services on that, the applications on that platform, right? The internet has your Amazon, your Facebooks, your Googles, and to varying degrees, you either pay with real money or you pay with your data. Uh, well, Ethereum is basically that. How do you value that? How do you value that access? It's probably worth a lot because can you imagine if you didn't have that in your lives today, well, go back to 1995, and you could probably imagine it very easily, because at that time, people were criticizing, well, what do I need to replace uh, my, my radio with a podcast? Why do I need to replace my TV with YouTube? Um, these things are easy to imagine today, but back then, people were all saying very skeptical things about it. So this is what's hard about data in, this, in the crypto industry, because within each of these kind of sectors and platforms, they all rely on different sets of data. So it's not the fact that the data itself isn't ubiquitous. We have a lot of things. We have on-chain data, we have transaction data, things that sit on centralized exchanges, decentralized exchanges, the transactions of what people are broadcasting across a decentralized exchange and saying, I wanna buy or sell this. Everyone is aware and familiar with it. So you can actually go and, actually, and, and decide what is relevant and what's not. The problem is with so much data, what do you do? And that's where I think the, the big challenge is inside of crypto. Even within a certain element, say something that we have something called total value locked, which says how much is actually, how much money, real dollars, is sitting on a platform right now. But what is the makeup of that? Is it actually converted into straight up dollars, i.e. stable coins? Or is it a token that maybe I'm a little bit more skeptical about? So that composition really matters, and you need to kind of differentiate it on a case-to-case -case basis.